Uh, good morning, everybody. I wonder if we could ask you to um, grab some food and take a seat, please. We're about to get going. I'm uh, Kevin Mulroy. I'm the Associate University Librarian here at UCLA. On behalf of uh, University Librarian Gary Strong, I'd like to welcome you to this program today, our joint venture with the um, American Indian Studies Research Center. Delighted to welcome you here. It's very informal. Please uh, just take some food and uh, take a seat. Um, I'm very proud that we've uh, engaged in this collaboration with the American Indian Studies Center. It's a terrific move forward for the library. Of course, we have a lot in common, um, pulling together scholarship, building collections. We have some fascinating oral history projects now underway. And uh, of course, showcasing new scholarship here in the library. And before I go any further, I do want to just spend a moment to thank Gloria Chacon. Where are you, Gloria? Gloria? Gloria. Yeah. <laughs> Gloria Chacon, who's largely responsible for putting on this program today. So if we could have a brief applause there. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce to you Angela Riley, who's our professor of law here at UCLA and the director of the American Indian Studies Research. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for coming here. It's so wonderful to see so many familiar and some new faces. And we are so delighted to host you um, and to have this event in conjunction with YRL. I also want to thank Gloria. I also want to thank Yulia Gosart, who is a student with us at the center, who also worked tirelessly on the center side to pull this together. So thank you, Yulia, as well. And um, thank you all for being here. Um, I will be brief. I'm just going to introduce um, Professor Peter Nabokov, who is in World Arts and Cultures. He's a professor here at UCLA. Uh, he's an esteemed author and anthropologist and has been a really ardent advocate of the center for many years and has also really worked to make American Indian Studies what it is at UCLA today. And we are delighted to have him as a discussant and he is going to introduce our other participants. Professor Nabokov. My name is Peter Nabokov, professor in American Indian Studies and World Arts and Cultures, and it's my signal honor today to introduce our guests. First is David Troyer, writer and teacher extraordinaire, flaneur of the boulevard in Saint-Germain, where I saw him smoking and leaning against the curb with his black leather jacket, you'd never have recognized him, who should be on our faculty but USC did an end run around our muscle-bound, tone-deaf backfield, and at least now he's within arm's reach for pickup games like today. David comes to us writing the crest of his fifth forthcoming book, Res Life, An Indian's Journey Through Reservation Life. Uh, a native of Leech Lake in northern Minnesota, Professor Troyer produces fiction, criticism, and in his new book, forthcoming book, a marvelous interwoven hybrid of often painfully personal memoir, and sweepingly deep and broad historical introduction to major issues in Indian country today. We're terrifically pleased to have him join us. David, there's always a warm meal and a full lecture hall waiting for you whenever you're on the west side. <laughs> but David and I are actually here <clears throat> to celebrate the latest publication by our own astonishingly prolific colleague here at UCLA, Dwayne Willard Champagne. In his recent notes from the center of Turtle Island, we have a compilation of, by my count, 91 of Duane's pithy essays, each a mini lecture on subjects that have been especially dear to Duane's committed heart and experienced intellect for nearly three decades. Tight nuggets based on experience at many levels of policy making and academic study and intense discussion in and out of classrooms, which he has grouped under nine headings that summarize these preoccupations community, identity, self-government, citizenship and membership, economic development, justice, 20 and 21st century Indian policies, and one particularly dear to me, international indigenous rights, for which he's been a somewhat lone voice on this campus, and I hope that voice grows and grows because we desperately need an indigenous rights, a larger scope to our concerns. <laughs> Straight out of Harvard and beginning with his published thoughts on urban education for Indian students back in 1980, Duane has tallied over 120 books, articles, forewords, reviews, and other writings, both single and co-authored, 
and that doesn't include the seven or more already now in the pipeline. A professor in sociology and American Indian studies here since 1984, Duane has witnessed the ups and downs and ups of our American Indian studies program, often in the driver's hot seat, seen its cast of academic characters come and go, and witnessed from academic policy and reservation perspectives years of tremendous tumult and change in Indian country at local, national, and academic levels. One could go on about the many hats Duane has worn and still wears, from enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, to advisory board member to Harvard's John Kennedy School of Government. As consultant and participant, his service work spreads over a range of roles and venues. But it is the sharp eye of wise witness that we are recognizing today with this new book. First, a quick word about the underappreciated tradition which it represents. Although in his introduction, Duane cites such journalistic pioneers as Tim Gallego of Lakota Times, which became the Indian country today, where Duane's pieces first appeared, the proud pioneering history of American Indian journalism goes way farther back than most people appreciate. As scholar of Cherokee culture history, Duane would be the first to cite the pioneering launch of the Cherokee Phoenix in 1828. And from David Troyer's Ojibwe homeland, there is the great newspaper tradition represented at White Earth and elsewhere. Over nearly 200 years, Indians have written about themselves for themselves, drawn their own cartoons, political cartoons, fought editorial wars of words over hot button local issues, and exercised their First Amendment rights way before they were ever granted the citizenship authority to do so. So here we have Duane joining the stream of a tradition championed by a Native American Journalist Association which today counts 600 or more newspapers and periodicals published throughout Indian country that most Americans never see or know about. And just as Vine Deloria would bravely throw his ideas into this pan-Indian mix, here we have Duane doing the same, the sure sign of someone less interested in making their academic mark than in elevating the discourse among Indians for Indians on the most pressing issues facing his people. As a former journalist, I want to shout out to honor this book and this man for this commitment and his studious passion and to open up his discussion on those pressing issues right now. I give you one of ours, Dwayne Champagne. Okay. Thank you, Peter, and um, thank you to the American Indian Study Center and the YRL Library for hosting this event. I'm very honored and pleased to be able to present this and glad to see everyone coming and hopefully um, sharing some of the um, thoughts and ideas that I've uh, written in the book. Now, um, this was, the idea for this book came very early to me. I had been thinking about this for some years. I always wanted to write something about policy. Um, that was relevant and would be discussed in, like, every day. I also wanted to orient the book toward um, indigenous people, actually community people. Not so much because I wanted just to feed them, but I wanted to develop a discussion with them, uh, <laughs> present some alternative um, points of view with them, and at the same time have other people who might not understand or be clued into indigenous issues to have some place where they can hear and listen in this discussion. And so, um, the opportunity to do this came when, when Indian Country Today, um, it was probably sometime in about 2006, um, asked me to be senior editor of the, uh, of the, of the newspaper. And, that, and they wanted me to write editorials. And, and, um, and so um, I thought, I, I actually, even before I signed the contract, I had this book in mind. In fact, more than one, actually. And, um, and even the title, Notes from the Center of Turtle Island, now, if you read the introduction, which many of you haven't done already, but um, I'm sure that others have, um, the, um, the book actually refers to a place where I grew up, which is a, a place called Turtle Mountain. And um, in there, about 50 miles away, is a town, a small town called Rugby, which is, has, a, has a, a stele or a little monument, which um, says that it's the center of um, North America. It's the geographical center of North America. And so some of the elders at Turtle Mountain actually took upon that, which is in the typical sort of irony of Indian humor, as well as, as, as a living and breathing and creating tradition, have um, said that, well, those guys are probably wrong. They're about 50 miles off. And the center of Turtle Island is actually Turtle Mountain. 
And so sometimes you hear the elders make those expressions. It's partly, it's partly an irony, it's, but they're partly serious as well. Um, the other part of the book, um, the notes, come from, um, a, um, comes from a Dostoevsky, who wrote a piece um, called, um, which, is, is, which is translated into English as Notes from Underground. And, and the problem with that translation is that underground has a connotation of being sort of subversive. And, um, and that's how people want to read his piece. And I think that there is some, some note to that. But, the, but, the, but, a, but a literal translation, I think, is uh, notes from beneath the field, which I think was, was more angling toward invisibility. And so that was part of the angle that I wanted to project or, or to actually, uh, as Dostoevsky did in, 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 in the small piece, um, notes from underground, um, sort of rail against the invisibility of, of, of the modern world, but here the invisibility of indigenous people, as well as the indigenous position in the world. And what the book is trying to do is articulate that position. Um, and it's, in, it's a work that's been heavily influenced by my own research and writings and thought and changing thought over time, and, um, and often um, when I wrote these essays, I had to write one every two weeks. Um, I, it, 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 it was some issue that I might be working on sort of triggered my mind. Or sometimes I sat in a seminar and, um, and students you know, brought up issues and I thought, well, I have to think about that. And so I presented those kinds of um, thoughts. So there develops a coherence in this, um, in this set of, um, of, of pieces, actually, um, that, that parallel actually some of the work that I want to write about and have been writing about. So these things have been mutually reinforcing. And let me, um, I, won't, I won't tell you all those themes because I want you actually to buy the book and read it. Um, but um, let me, um, let me um, um, sort of indicate what some of those themes are. And I think that they're um, um, somewhat, um, um, I think they're somewhat uh, pressing issues and, um, and, and I think the articulations are are designed to um, raise the consciousness of not only of indigenous people, but anybody who's involved in the indigenous world or anybody who's interested in um, sort of you know, world relations, um, peace, and, and those kinds of issues. Um, the, um, the, 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 the set of, um, of, of chapters, as Peter has already mentioned, um, 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 have, have a certain kinds of sub-themes. But, um, but working through these things, there is in fact a pattern. And, um, and, 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 and it starts with community and identity and it builds and builds to, to policy, to justice, to, to um, ultimately international relations. So that's how the book is to be read. I mean, I, I try to, uh, in the beginning, try to, un try to, to uh, comment on, on what community means to indigenous people. How is that different than non-indigenous people? And um, what does citizenship mean? And, um, and ultimately, what do human rights mean? And one of the arguments I make, which I want to articulate because I don't have time, is largely that civil rights and human rights and indigenous rights are not the same thing. <coughs> and that one, in fact, in fact, you might even be antagonistic at certain points. But, um, but let me, uh, just, for the, just for the entertainment value of it, uh, chat a little bit about one of the, one, a, couple of, a couple of the little essays. And the, and the one that I want to talk about is a little unusual, actually, for the rest of the book. But, but it's a, but but it's but it's a, um, a kind of a kind of unusual piece, which I think which which I call sort of the two Quaker presidents, and um, and this and this came out of some research that I had done, I was asked to do for the National Museum of the American Indian. They wanted to put on a, a, um, a um, an exhibition that would attract a whole lot of American attention. They were having some trouble doing that, focusing largely on community interpretations of themselves and what they wanted to present to the rest of the world. So what they thought was that if we, if we, if we wrote a book and put on a presentation of presidents and their, relation, their personal relationships to Indians, and that they, that would actually attract a whole lot of attention. And, then, and I was on one of the committees and I said, you know, that sounds like a fine idea. And so and then some months later they asked me to actually write one of the pieces, which I frankly hadn't anticipated. Um, but they asked me to write a piece, which I thought was unusual when they, when they, when they gave it to me. Um, was uh, appeared from 1930 to 1970, and I thought, like, wow, that's a strange period. I mean, it's like, I mean, Hoover's already president for about a year or so, and then, that, and it's the very beginning of Nixon. He's, he's, he's probably inaugurated in '69, and I'm going to finish in '70. It seems like, well, I mean, why? 
And so I wrote back a, you know, a note to the editor saying, like, look, this seems rather strange. Why can't I just move over and just you know, forget about, you know, or, or just do Hoover and forget about Nixon? And he never responded to me. And uh, so, I, <laughs> so, so I said, okay, willy-nilly, I gotta, gotta do, uh, do the thing. And so that, it, it turned out, the project itself turned out to be more interesting than I ever imagined. I mean, in fact, it's one of these things where you just fell into it. And that actually going back and looking at the, the, the documents of the, of the presidents, and, and their Indian policies, and also any personal contacts that they that they knew, was extraordinarily interesting. I mean, it turned out that um, that Roosevelt had a very strong interest with Will, Ro a very strong friendship with Will Rogers, you know, even before the election when he became president, and that they exchanged a whole series of of, um, of very often humorous um, um, notes and letters. But that's not what I want to talk about, actually. But what it, what it turned out when I when I was trying to understand uh, policy. Um, and, and presidents and Indians, um, it turned out that Hoover was a, was a Quaker. And it turned out that Nixon was also a Quaker. And after I read all this stuff, it seemed to me that both Hoover and Nixon had the most influence on policy throughout the 20th century. And they both were trying to do good things for Indians, but from very different perspectives. Hoover, in many ways, was the, the architect of termination policy. And back in the 20s and 30s, many of the, um, of the Quaker groups were very in favor of this. They changed their mind in the 40s and the 50s. Now, Quakers, of course, you know, are you know, William Penn in Pennsylvania and tr very early treaties with the Delawares and lots of other Indians in that area. And so that, and so that the so-called Quaker plan in Pennsylvania was that you would buy the land from the Indians peacefully, you would honor them in treaties, and if two Indian groups tried to buy this, claim the same piece of land, you bought it from both of them. In the very beginning, it's said that uh, Penn held very religiously to this point of view, his children, his sons, and what happened after were not quite the same. But, but, this, but this idea of the Quakers and, 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 the, um, and the, um, the treaty method of um, buying land was, frankly became part of American policy. And, um, now, um, like I said, Hoover was, um, the architect of, um, of termination policy. He believed that Indians were living on reservations as second-class citizens, and all of the demographic statistics on health and education were very dismal about Indians, and he thought that the best thing for them was, for, frankly, to abandon the reservations. And not only that, they were very expensive at the same time. He had, he had um, in fact, he wrote some very interesting, very, very, very um, powerful piece in his autobiography and explained his positions, which was extraordinary. Um, he argued that um, Indians needed um, a, their own um, 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 court system, their own um, 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 uh, um, 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 their own, their own sort of um, court in order, in order, in order, I mean, the, the federal government should set up a court system in which they would actually adjudicate land. Many of the tribal groups had, uh, were very successful in going to Congress in his day and, 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 and getting Congress to actually, um, 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 you know, pre pre present them with a land claim. But, 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 but uh, the president, um, Hoover, said that they often um, um, vetoed these bills because he, saw, he thought it was very un, um, unfair that some particular tribes that were well mo organized and well mobilized could go to Congress and get these, these bills um, through Congress, while many others couldn't. So he, um, so he, cr so he, so he ultimately set, set up the idea of the Court of Claims, um, which ultimately was passed into law by Truman, and then later, I think it lasted until about 1976. He also set up the idea that the Indians could only get the amount of land or the price for the land at the time they negotiated the treaty. So if you are in 1855 negotiated a treaty for 10 cents an acre, they would give you only 10 cents an acre whenever you appeal to the Court of Claims, the Indian Court of Claims, ultimately. And, um, and so um, he argued that the, the value of the land um, was increased largely by American um, um, economic development, and therefore, um, the, um, um, the, the Indians shouldn't necessarily, you know, benefit from the, uh, the from the value of land. It turns out that um, that Hoover had tremendous influence because it, 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 Truman, after 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 um, after uh, President Roosevelt and the, and the Indian New Deal, Truman was not an adherent of the New Deal. In fact, started working with Hoover and had Hoover on various commissions, and they, in fact, started to do 
set up the whole logic of the, of the, um, of the Termination Act. The, the post-World War II period actually is very different. There's a lot of um, human rights issues floating around in the UN, partly because of the, uh, the uh, atrocities in, in, the, um, in, the, in the camps. And there was a lot of, um, of um, sort of debate between the Soviet Union and the United States about who held up human rights. The Americans always accused the, the, um, the, um, the Soviets of, um, of uh, a more centralized authoritarian system in which human rights weren't being realized. And the, and the Soviets actually criticized the Americans for handling uh, race relations and ethnic relations, but, but more particularly Indian relations. And so the solution for this, for the Truman and Eisenhower administrations was civil rights as well as for minorities and black folks. And so, so the government had some international pressure to improve civil rights. But civil rights for American Indians meant termination. Truman and Eisenhower all thought that Indians needed to be moved off reservations where they were second class citizens and where they were very poor, very, very marginalized, and very low levels of education. And he believed that moving into the American mainstream was in fact offering them equality, full citizenship. And so that was the argument behind termination, at least from the presidential point of view. The termination was not very actively pursued either by Eisenhower or Truman or any president actually, it was actively pursued by Congress. <laughs> Members of Congress in the 1950s passed a whole series of laws. In fact, termination was largely enacted by acts of Congress to a large extent. Now, when I got to Kennedy, I was in, in Johnson, I thought that, wow, this is gonna be a whole different change but was, was quite surprised when I got there that both Kennedy and Johnson pursued the very same policies. They were very much interested in um, economic development, in equality, and civil rights, but they were not interested in what you might call an indigenous position. They, they even argued that they were doing a very slow termination policy. They would wait until <coughs> Indians became economically self-sufficient and they'd become citizens of the United States and they would not need to be um, um, they, would not, they would not need to be uh, in Indian status anymore. Now, when President Kennedy addressed the Indians, he called them first Americans, and, and so did Johnson. And by this, they meant the first citizens of the United States. But that belies very much the history of, of Indian communities, which were not citizens of the United States and were not in many ways consensual citizens of the United States after the legislative acts in 1924 and previous legislative acts. So unlike immigrants, Indians did not consent to becoming American citizens. And this is an issue that wor works all the way around the world. I mean, Latin and South America, indigenous people are often automatically claimed by the governments to be citizens. They are not asked to be citizens and they, in fact, often have very different cultures and even their own political systems by which they actually have, have strong uh, allegiances and, and prefer to live in those, in, in, in those, in those um, communities. Now, um, and so when I came to Nixon, which I only had one year of, um, and, 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 um, and since I had 1970, Nixon made a a statement, a statement about policy in July of 1970. So I got to do Nixon in the very early Nixon. The rest of the, the, rest of the years actually I, I, I didn't do in my, didn't do in my uh, essay, although I think uh, um, they later revised my essay and put some other stuff in from 1970 to 1975. And so that was sort of different material. But, I, but, but in, the, in the essay that I wrote, it was only up to 1970, which was great because I was able to um, to uh, analyze um, his papers and, in fact, uh, his presentation. Now, there, now during, the, during this period, there's really only two real presidential um, uh, presentations on Indian policy um, during the whole 20th century. I mean, some where, where the president sat out and went to Congress and said, here's Indian policy. And, um, and, 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 and as, a special, as a special event where he was actually trying to comment on policy. It was actually, um, Johnson did this in 68. But then, and then Nixon in 70. And what's remarkable about Nixon is that, is that he actually um, set up the relationship between Indians and the United States on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a basis of, um, of treaties. 
a nation to nation ship, nation to nation ship relationship. Now, this is what Indian people had always wanted, and during the 60s and 70s, they had, all, had already argued before the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, but they, were left, they had a deaf ear to this position. They largely held within the model of, of assimilation and citizenship. But, um, but Nixon, who, actually, who did solicit some of this talk um, uh, from, from the communities, did this very early in the year. Now, now there's, there's a lot of uh, scholarship now about, um, about the Red Power Movement and things like that, and that's all, and, and, and I think it, did, it had a, a big effect, I think, on consciousness and understanding of indigenous positions. But Nixon largely proposes what is called the Self-Determination Act before the Red Power Movement really got, in, got going. There was um, some movement and some discussion, but, um, but Nixon already sets up what is really an a, a government that recognizes the government-to-government um, the -government relationship with indigenous people. But that doesn't sound too unusual for us, but let me just say that there's probably no other country in the world that actually does that. I mean, they don't do it in Latin and South America. There's sometimes, they, sometimes some constitutions recognize territory, but they don't recognize the government-to-government -government relationship. Don't recognize indigenous people as actual governments in which you have to deal with. They, there's some movement toward that, that in Canada in some ways that would parallel very much the United States. But not in Australia, but not in virtually any place else in the world. Indigenous people are considered citizens. And therefore, if you have citizens' rights, you do not have indigenous rights. You have equality. In many ways, what, what emerges from some of the discussion, I'll get a little ahead of myself, is that the liberal democratic system does not have the intellectual tools to deal with indigenous people. It only wants to assimilate and make people into equal citizens. Dealing with another form of government, another culture, trying to understand what that means, in fact, is a very difficult thing. For, in, in fact, they do not do it very well at all. And, I, and, and, and it's one of the issues that I actually um, talk about in the 21st century policy part, is, is how, how, how he claims the solutions to that. So, so Nixon has been something of a, an enigma, and, and of course people, he's not a very popular character anymore, but, but there's a little bit of literature on Nixon about, like, why did he do this? And um, some people thought, you know, there's, there's the international argument about um, race relations and things like that, but that fits much better with, um, with, with um, uh, civil rights. And as, and, 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 and as I develop this, the civil rights movement and the indigenous and the indigenous rights movements tend to be very different things, have very different goals, and have very different methods, and have very different people. The purpose of, indige of the indigenous rights movement was not equality in the American system. When, it, when termination policy offered citizenship, American Indians were interested in, in full citizenship, but not at the cost of giving up indigenous rights. That led to Ultimately, when, 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 the United, when the indigenous folks, the Indians in the United States, were able to um, stop termination policy, led to a sort of de facto dual citizenship in, and a, a parallel movement in Canada, where, where, where you, as, as Americans, as Indian people have, have the rights of citizens, but they also have the rights of indigenous folks. So why did Nixon do this, is, is, is the question. There's a variety of different arguments people make. There's the external pressure movements, there's the red power argument, and there's, some, there's probably some truth to that to a certain extent, that uh, Alcatraz Island, of course, started in um, November of probably 1969, so that's like about you know, six or seven months before he, he writes, he, he presents the self-determination policy. Um, and so that, that was in the news every day and, and all through that period. Um, um, there's, um, there's two other kinds of arguments that people make. One is that he had a, a coach while he was at Whittier College, which is a Quaker institution. Uh, he had a football coach that was very dear to him. In fact, he writes in his autobiography that this guy, Coach Wallace Chief, that he, called, he calls, calls him, um, he, in fact, had, a, um, he had the most effect or influence on his life other than his father. This is what Nixon writes. So there's some, so, 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 so Wallace, it's not clear that Wallace ever talked Indian policy to him, but it's, um, the, um, the other argument is that in fact he's a Quaker. And there's a very strong Quaker movement in, 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 in California. And, um, 
Quakers since the 1750s had interacted with Indian, Indian communities. They were familiar with the treaty arrangements. Um, they often met, exchanged, you know, um, ceremonies and um, had knowledge of each other. And, and, and since the 1940s, the Quaker movement had been very supportive of the anti-termination policy. And so um, an, another interesting example of California is that um, um, Lowell Bean, when he, when he uh, did uh, research in, um, in um, um, Algo Caliente and, and places, places around there, the Cahuillas, he actually writes in his book that the first, he, before he actually went out to meet anyone, he actually talked to the Quakers, found out who the right contacts were, and then, then with the Quaker introduction, actually went into the field to visit with people. So, um, so, so, so what I, what, and it's a little piece that I, um, um, that I wrote on the two Quaker presidents, then I, 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 make, I sort of make the argument that, in fact, um, the two Quaker presidents seem to be the, 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 um, the, the, um, the main intellectual contributors to Indian policy in very different ways. Of course, Hoover with its assimilation policy, and with Nixon with, um, frankly, recognizing treaties and recognizing really an indigenous position. And since Nixon, I think that there's been very few presidents who have had the knowledge that Nixon had, or at least the insight he might have had. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and although the self-determination policy has become the law, um, it's, there's been you know, a, a whole lot of um, um, probably less attention to Indian issues by, by, by the courts and by the, um, by, by the presidents and even by the Congress. And that's what I talk about much in the rest of the book, and so I'll not, uh, not introduce you to that. But what emerged from this, um, in this particular um, um, case study of, um, of U.S. Um, and, um, and recent movements like the Declaration is, um, is um, an argument about the Declaration, in fact, in fact, the critique of the Declaration, and which I won't, um, I won't um, since I've got limited time, and I probably ran over time already, I won't uh, elaborate for you, but it largely argues that the, um, that the Declaration is, 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 is um, ma manufactured within the context of the nation states, that um, Indians are assumed to be citizens of nations, and that there's no recognition of indigenous positions or rights inherent in those documents. That, I, I, in many ways, I think that the Declaration is progress. It's, um, it, 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 it opens up a whole lot of, um, of thought and, and possible action on a whole series of issues, especially collective human rights issues. But it is, in, in many ways, a pluralistic cultural argument, um, an argument that that, that indigenous people's cultures are very similar to any citizen's cultures. People, people have bundles of rights, bundles of cultures that they can choose and play with. And, um, and, um, and it does not recognize that indigenous communities may not share the same political, cultural orientations or fundamental relations of state or government with nation states. And that is the contention for indigenous people. It's a very different set of, so, it's a different social order. So there's, there's maybe 375 million people in the, United, in the world that are indigenous, maybe 5,000 entities, all of them quite unique culturally and socially. And they all retain a sense of identity and community. And, and, part, and part of the work that I talk about in the very early in the essay in the book about community identity is aimed to, 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 to explore those kinds of issues. Why are they different? How are they different? And why don't they, in fact, just assimilate? So if all these people just assimilated, we wouldn't have an issue. But there's a very large number of people around the world that are very strong commitments to, to forms of social and political organization that, in fact, are not entirely um, compatible with nation states. And that's the issue, I think, that is, see, we see in the future, how to establish ground rules getting nation states to recognize indigenous peoples and communities as being, frankly, different forms of political order. That the world is not just made up of nation states, it's made up of many hundreds of different social and political forms, and indigenous people, frankly, are one type, perhaps, it might be even others, um, and that the world is socially and culturally more complex than the nation state system would give us. And that leads to a whole series of discussion, debate, even coercion, cultural and political in indigenous communities as they struggle around these ideas. To a large extent around the world, indigenous people are in fact 
assumed to be citizens, assumed to be under the control of states. And in many ways, I don't think that the Declaration relieves them of those issues. But I've talked way too long, and so let me, let me stop there. Thank you. <laughs> And so, David, could you, you have some opening thoughts, questions for Dwayne? I do. Comments. I, I, I do. Um, but first, let me say thanks for, for having me here. Um, here. Um, I'm, I'm new to California, <laughs> so thanks for having me uh, for, um, across town. And um, let me also say how, you know, how confused I am by situations like these where I, I want to talk to Dwayne and we're, we're talking for you, and so. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's just, you know, my, my, natural, my natural sort of, um, you know, schizophrenia kicks in. But I did want to say that, that um, I, I really loved reading this book, and I was really impressed by you know, what, what is, in effect, a, a really, what I think is a really brave book. Um, you tackle all sorts of issues about quality of life on reservations to, to you know, how treaties function, to how identity functions. You know, you, you tackle these sort of, these not hot button issues like identity and community and enrollment. You know, none of these get anyone irate, ever. <laughs> and um, so I was really impressed by that. And I was, I was so impressed by, by how you bring up and take strong positions on a number of issues. And you do it so coolly. And uh, so I have all sorts of marginalia. The dominant one is being like Dwayne. Be like Dwayne, <laughs> and um, if you, anyone's read my work, you know what I mean. Um, just, just so calm and with such purpose, and so I really enjoyed reading this. Well, let me interject a little bit right there, because um, cause when I first started writing the essays, um, I, I, was, I would look for them you know, in the newspaper, and I found out that they weren't using my name on them. And I was a little puzzled at first, not, being, you know, not knowing very much about journalism. And it turns out that I was writing as the voice of the newspaper, not as a person. <laughs> that gave me a huge amount of license, <laughs> <laughs> which I unfortunately have revealed now. <laughs> but I did have a question about Hoover. I was thinking about this. This was a, a huge shock to think of, to, of Hoover and Nixon together. Um, it's still shocking. And, uh, but, and you mentioned in passing, just in passing, that Hoover's father was an Indian agent in Osage country? Oh, his, his uncle. His uncle. His uncle, yeah. He, um, his, hmm. his parents died very, when he was only about eight. And he was raised and, by his uncle. It, for, he spent a, a summer. Oh, just a summer. Uh, just with, with his uncle, who was an Indian agent at the, for the Osage. And um, apparently he, he uh, developed some ties to some of the, huh. some of the people there. And, but then later went on to Washington and something. I was wondering when that was, and this is my questions for you, and maybe we can all read the benefits, but I thought maybe his, his, his policy of, or the policy of termination, which many of us experiences and continue to experience is so harmful, was actually born of the best intentions where, I mean, if you, if you sort of were around Osage country around the turn of the century, you couldn't help but see all sorts of violence and murder and dispossession because of all that oil leasing and all that stuff. I, would, I was wondering if that played into his if you just saw the setup as one that was... Well, um, you don't get very much from him because he's only like about eight years old. Yeah. And so um, he t talks a lot about you know, hanging out with some of the kids and sh you know, hunting squirrels and things like that. And, it, and because he was a Quaker, he couldn't use a rifle. In fact, so he had used tri bows and arrows and stuff, which the kids taught him how to do. Um, <laughs> but but I, think, I, I think it was the summer of 1886 or something like that. I'm not sure if the oil is oh, a big deal yet. right oh, there. Okay. Yeah. Quite a few Quaker agents in Indian territory in those years. Really? Yeah. 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 Tatum and others in Western. Yeah. So. Yeah. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. You go go ahead. ahead. Uh, well, I want to jump. Out. One of the things that I kept wondering was, what does Duane think American Indian study should be based on these concerns 50 years from now? Um, well, what would um, you like to see happening? What would you like to see the concerns if? If it has to do with the reconsideration of this whole uh, citizens uh, versus or indigenous um, uh, kind of notions of belonging, how would we be teaching it? How would what kinds of subjects would we be bringing into American? Would there be an American Indian studies? Would it be indigenous studies? Um, 
I mean, there can be American Indian studies. I mean, I've been writing about this, and I didn't write explicitly this because I was not trying to, um, um, the audience that I had, I didn't think it was going to be terribly you know, academic, but, um, but it is an issue that I've written, written about in other places. And it does fall into a whole scheme of what I've developed uh, through this book and other stuff. But largely, there, the, the position I've been emerging toward is that there is something called indigenous studies. There's national studies would be American Indian studies. That would be just the, the, the indigenous people in, that are involved with the American state, which ha probably has its own dynamic, its own legal history and things like that. But, but the argument is largely that um, it's pl played out a little bit in, 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 in some of the identity issues. It's about well, who are indigenous people? Are they minority groups? Are they racial groups? And that's how they're classified in social sciences. But that does not give any, any really sh sh um, any real analytical strength to understanding indigenous people at all. I mean, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're arguing that they're just a racial or ethnic group, then they are, then the, all the argu arguments about uh, I, uh, of, um, of independence, self-government, territory, all those things don't make sense. And so, and so, and so it's, it's not, and this is not just the phenomenon of the United States, you find this all over the world, where you, where you, you, you talk to people, what they talk about is autonomy. They're looking for cultural autonomy, political autonomy. What, what that means in each particular nation state, like in, like in Mexico or, or Brazil, means something somewhat, somewhat different, depending on how much the nation state will actually work with you on those ideas. In many cases, none. And so, um, and so, and so, so the argument that w I think works within this framework and the, and, the present, and, and, and the ideas I've presented is that, yes, there's in fact something you might call indigenous studies. Thousands of different cultures around the world who are working with nation states. It's, it's, they, they, they probably have a, a very different solution, but they have a nation state which, in, to a large extent, is not recognizing them and wants to assimilate them or marginalize them. And so it's those relationships in which can be the a whole series of studies of, 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 of different cultures, different forms of identity. And this is different from the anthropological, you know, um, what you might call the, um, um, the ethnographic present. It's not about trying to recover the, what the identities were before Western contact. This is all about indigeneity and the ideas that emerge from it in contact with nation states. That you all, of us, when, they, when people start to challenge you, your political and cultural and, 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 and um, cultural orientations, then you have to respond to them in some way especially if they're using you know, force and power against you to take land and resources and, and, and actually um, impair your form of life. So then you have a, a, a sort of a contentious situation, you know, political, economic, cultural. And the emphasis is largely on those terms in the paper. Because you can make arguments about race in North and South America, because often Indians are you know, probably a different race than most of the settler communities. But you do have indigenous people all over the world where in fact the race of the people who control the state and the race of the indigenous people are the same. You have the very similar kinds of arguments. I've sat at sat in of meetings uh, with the uh, Samis who are talking about creating you know, a Sami parliament in, in Scandinavia and the same arguments you hear with groups in the United States. You hear the same words, you hear the same same problems. They're worried about self-government. They were included in the in the parliaments of um, Scandinavia, and Finland, and um, Sweden um, in the in the 1960s. But they, for about, after about 20 years, decided they could not. Even though they were represented at the parliament, they had virtually no power to protect their interests. They decided that they wanted to form essentially a Sami parliament, and that's what they're doing now. They want to protect territory. They want the rights to control the assets on, in their territories. That means also oil and coal and those kinds of things. They cannot develop without actually controlling the land. They have huge contentions with those state systems. But those are exactly the kinds of contentions. Very different cultures, very different social and political systems, very different, um, and, 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 and not feeling like entering, giving up their social system for citizenship. That's a trade-off that many of these communities don't make, are not willing to make. So, all, so yeah, so I think that um, there's a huge amount of work to be done uh, all over the world in this, in this, in this box. I mean, I'll call, I'll call that indigenous studies, but there's something called American Indian studies could, would focus mainly on the United States, which is a special case, frankly. Um, 
of, of this of, of a broader phenomenon. Let's open it up. <laughs> Joseph. I have a question about the, uh, I mean, so the way you'll, you'll only, only learn in the future, I guess, the consequences of having your name on these pieces. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm wondering if there were, if there were <coughs> comment sections when the editorials were published um, on Indian countries today, and if you followed that at all, and kind of how that played out, that's interesting. I followed it a little. I didn't uh, read them religiously. Um, um, but generally, there were actually interesting comments, and occasionally, of course, people took took uh, took um, you know um, uh, positions that opposed to mine. I mean, I took um, you know, I, I, I didn't I didn't take controversial positions just to take controversial positions. I took positions where I I, I felt strongly about the issue. And let's say one of the controversial positions I took was. Um, the issue of a membership in tribal communities and, 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 and the fact that some people, some communities were um, excommunicating, or, or I'm not sure what the word, the technical word for it is. Disenrolling. Disenrolling, right. And so, so I write this essay saying that I didn't think that that was a very good strategy in that, that, that an indigenous position, and this is how I tried to frame some of these things. Not that I know everything about what an indigenous position should be, but I, but I, do, but I am a student of, of culture and world view. And so, I, so, so, trying, so whenever there was an issue, I said, okay, well, I don't want to take, frankly, much of the stuff that I learned in graduate school, which were very Western materialist interpretations of the world, in which I sp I've spent a lot of time trying to you know, rethink those and trying to move away from them. But I, all, but I also wanted to introduce what I thought was, what's an indigenous perspective on this particular issue? And so the disenrollment thing in particular, this is when I was still hidden away so, so I could write this stuff. And, um, <laughs> And I and I so I so I, I said that well I, I didn't think that that was a, a, a correct indigenous position that um, that people that the purpose of of, of, of even gaming or for um, nation building or or, or, or creating a, a tribal entity is in fact to invite all the indigenous people to to come to strengthen to to be able to realize their identities to come and be part of your community so 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 I didn't so the argument that I was making is that. Um, that should, you shouldn't be excommunicating people, that we should be in making as many people, in a certain sense, you know, able to um, live in an indigenous community, if that was their choice. I mean, if they wanted to do that, you should be maximizing that. And so we should be drawing in as many members as we could, rather than excluding people for, for whatever reasons. Yes? Yeah, how do we get Native American studies in the junior colleges of um, good, yeah. good question. Actually. At Sacramento, we give a little money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. That's a real good That's question. Really Particularly while we're watching those courses decline by the month. In you know, in Middle America, at least in Minnesota, anyway, you know, the the, the tribes actually have started a bunch of community colleges, and those are the primary junior colleges in the state of Minnesota are the ones that are that are run by Fond du Lac, by Leech Lake, White Earth. Red Lake is trying, you know, all these community colleges which are reservation based attract students from the reservation but also non-native students as well and these, they're the big, they're the big force in education in the state, I would say, at least in Indian education, it's huge. Yeah, well, they're the, the center of everything. County, well, that's, yeah, I don't know about that. Well, California's kind of a, a difficult place to run a tribal community college because it's, there's a very strong and sophisticated community college system already here. It works better in very isolated places or in states where there's not much of a community college tradition. So I think that um, the efforts to make DQ work in, 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 in um, California have not met with success. In part, uh, I, um, um, to move the, move, the, move, move the discussion a little bit, uh, probably in a direction you weren't anticipating, um, in part is because um, the tribes have not supported it. And there's an argument about what is indigenous studies at the university? What purpose does it serve? And I talk a little bit about that in, one, in a few of the essays, but largely, um, the purpose of, of indigenous studies is, is ethnic diversity. It's funded by the state institutions. And so even that perspective does not really count for an indigenous perspective. In, 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 in UCLA here, for instance, we're part of four ethnic groups. That's what they actually say. So when you start talking about indigenous perspectives and different points of view on that and how you might approach different kinds of problems, we're often very different than the other, than the Chicano Studies Center and the Black Studies Center. And the Asian American studies because they have they have they have a different experiences than us. They're, they're and they're not it's not, not that's not usually an indigenous perspective. So so indigenous perspectives are extremely marginal and alien to the university. 
and that's probably why they're so hard to do, hard to, to, to use. And, um, and very few people know about them. You, um, even in tribal communities, there's very little, the school systems don't enter into any of these discussions. Increasingly, that's becoming you know, some, somewhat more attention to it. But, but, but I grew up in BIA schools and never heard anything about tribal, tribal government or tribal sovereignty or anything like that. And so and I expect it's still the same. I don't think there's a very strong movement in K through 12 anywhere. Where, but, um, but ultimately, I think the problem is that if tribal communities can't support indigenous studies, there will not be indigenous studies. There will be ethnic studies. And I think that that is not entirely satisfactory from my point of view. Thank you. I would only add, uh, having started my teaching career in uh, 68 at Monterey Peninsula College, teaching the first Indian studies course ever there, and watching the rise and fall and rise and fall of, of, of the program in Monterey, that you have, to, you, have to, you have to guilt trip the politicos. You have to go to Sacramento, you have to remind them of the genocidal history of Indian white relations in California, and you have to shame them into doing so. I mean, the, the, the junior college system in California is the largest uh, educational system in the world, over 300 campuses. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge block. But there's, there's still a lot of vulnerability, and it has not been utilized. I think there's a lot of work to be done on the K, yeah. you know, I'm just getting people out of high school, and especially in a state like California, but, but still at the college level, where frankly some of the more innovative work is done. There's still much, much to be done, and, and, and I, I don't think we're well understood by the administration, and we're just not in their sort of ultimate interest in a sense. What always happens, Dwayne's absolutely right, he's seen it here, but I've seen it <laughs> in a number of places, is uh, some administrator wants to have a rainbow coalition, and that means all ethnic groups get, get, a, get collapsed into, into that ethnic de definition, and as he's eloquently said, it just doesn't work. No, I think that, um, just to keep on, on the hammering on that, um, is that um, part, of, part of the, the, I think, what is, an, is, is a, an unusual perspective I take in the book is that, um, that, I'm, um, that I believe that, that the, the indigenous perspective is um, largely one of, of cooperative relationships with other entities. This is, this is, this is like um, working with, um, you know, like the uh, Iroquois Tree of Peace and those kinds of concepts, is that what, uh, what, what is normal is not war. What is normal is peace and order. That's a real theme in indigenous communities, is trying to maintain order. And even, even the trickster figures are guys that, you know, all these funny stories about being selfish and doing funny things that break the rules are all about the fear of, of disorder. And, what, and, and so the trickster figures are really examples of what not to do, or what the consequences of doing, of breaking the order. And so, and so order, I think, is, 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 um, is very central to indigenous communities. And, and that order includes the plants, the animals, other human beings. And so the, the norm is to have respectful relationships with other people, other communities, other nations, even nation states. I don't think that, the per, that indigenous perspective is, is a nationalist perspective that wants to separate from the nation state, but rather wants to have consensual, wants to have respectful, relationships, democratic relationships with the nation states, which they don't get, which, which, which is part of what has to be negotiated. But even, but, but it's, but even if the state continues to be persistent in its, in, in its con, you know, constraining behavior, then you still tolerate that and you keep on working. That your goal is in fact to have these peaceful relationships, to have the relationships where you respect each other's culture, they respect ours, we respect theirs. Indigenous people is not, a, not a, it's not a movement to overthrow the state or even challenge the state, but is is this movement to get the state to respect you and to honor you, and to allow you to, to live the way that you want to. So I don't see that as, you know, as a, um, um, I see that as the goal, sort of the ideal, you know. Is this then a morals and ethics issue? Then? Does it come down to that really that morals and ethics between the two entities? In, 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 um, it's, it's certainly part of it, but but being a sociologist, I mean, it has a lot to do with politics and power and wealth and things like that as well. So it can't be just reduced down to just moral and ethics. But moral and ethics are part of the part of it. Yeah. Well, thinking, uh, thinking on along those lines, I mean, I, and as you know, probably as you know, surely better than I do. I mean, 
when you know Leech Lake. By the way, you know, both being a Jibway, this is this is a coup, right? Um, but when Bugan and Gijek was was fighting against removal to White Earth, and he made distinctions, he made some racial distinctions between you know who should get removed and who should get annuities. He's making distinctions between full bloods and what he himself referred to as breeds, and this was thinly disguised. It was really not about race; it was about class. You know, he wanted to exclude these people who had access because he wanted access to annuities and so on. He's, you know, he was powerful and kind of right. greedy too, right. Right. a problematic kind of guy. Right. Um, so where does class, so continuing that sort of tension, this racial class tension, which was experienced in Ojibwe country during relocation in the 19th century, where does class fit in? Because I see a lot of, I don't see as much of a discussion of class in these pieces. Uh, and I was just curious, because it's such an important piece of, of so much and I would only underscore that because you've studied Cherokees, and if there's one thing that, of course, is a constant problem in the hist Cherokee culture history, it's the business of class. Right. Um, well, um, I, I've, I've been underemphasizing class. I mean, um, um, largely because um, I'm trying to um, understand um, a, um, um, a more holistic indigenous perspective. Now. Um, even in the Cherokee case, say Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, where there are clear class structures in the 1830s and 40s, and they're slave owners, and they're um, and there's actually real accumulation of wealth. People are living in mansions and stuff, and um, but but their national identities were still Cherokee. Their uh, their kinship ties were still Cherokee. I mean, the reason that you became a member of a prominent family is because often traders, European traders, married into uh, prominent lineages for trade and other personal interests. And then those children are very well placed for leadership in the next, in the next generation. So that happens a lot. Um, there are some tensions in um, Cherokee society about, um, about the class relations. But the, but, but the more conservative folks that weren't into the marketplace, or subsistence farmers and things like that, they did accept those people and, and, and in part because of the, um, of the pressures that was happening in, at that time in the 20s and 30s of, uh, of American land um, negotiations and losses of land. So that, so that the argument that the leadership did with John Ross and company um, largely is that we can save the nation, we can save the territory, we can save self-government if we bind together and if we change some of our institutions. That was an argument that did not go so well with many folks, but ultimately that was what prevailed. And after they decided that, they held on to that kind of system um, thereafter. The um, Ross, of course, was probably about one-eighth Cherokee. Probably did not speak fluent Cherokee. But he was the leader of not the, the slave owners or the, or the upper class. He was the leader of the, the traditionals because they were the majority and they held the power, at least in the, during Ross's lifetime. And so that was still a very much run as a consensus based political leadership system. Ross, in fact, just moved into it, being a very astute politician and also a nationalist. So, so but, my, but, my, but, to, but my argument about this stuff is I'm not, um, I'm not trying to give a prescription in, in the pieces that I'm writing. I'm not trying to say that, you know, that the Cherokee model is the best model or the Oklahoma model is the best model. I'm not trying to say that at all. What I'm trying to do is just open up a series of questions and arguments and issues that people should address while they're going forward. There are hundreds of different communities, and ultimately sovereignty is about those communities making their own choices, not about some scholar or commenter making choices for you. I'm just trying to set up the, trying to develop a discussion where you can make better choices, but, but, but what choice you make is up to that particular community. Now I've been to communities that um, are very non-traditional, you know, in, uh, that, you might, that the, the, in the language I use, that in which you have Indian folks who've become ethnically Indian, meaning that they are by you know descendants of Indian people, but frankly have no strong attachments to any kind of culture um, or or any kind of um, ethical Indian worldview, and um, and they run tribal governments. And the, and the large majority of the community are, and these are even Ojibwe communities, actually do, do, do that. And, um, and, um, and so, in a certain sense, I cannot judge that group. 
that is, that's, they have a traditional group among them, maybe about 20% of the community, and they're unhappy. But ultimately, they're, they're a sovereign group. They've made certain kinds of choices. And then, and that's the choice they made. I'm not judging that case. That, that, that uh, this is where I'm, uh, the, the academia comes into me. I'm, I'm kind of much more uh, um, sort of uh, astounded by the way that more, but communities approach the same problems mm -hmm. of trying to do, it's the variation of the cases. I mean, you have class structures among you know, the Cherokees and the, and the Choctaws in the, in, the, in the 1830s and 40s, but that's a, that's a very unusual set of events. I mean, there's nothing like it. I mean, I would say that the Cherokees and Choctaws and Creeks formed constitutional governments that are more sound than any of the constitutional governments that we have today in Indian country. How can they do that so early? There are peculiar historical and cultural reasons for that, and I think that's why I wrote the book about them. It's about, it's about, I mean, I, and so, and so um, there are, the conditions now are very different than they were in the 1820s and 30s. And I could elaborate them, but I won't have time. But, the, um, but, but part of what I'm trying to do with this book, especially in the last part of the 21st century and the, and the, um, and the um, uh, international arena, is to try to understand what is the cultural and political context of the contemporary indigenous situation. And does it give constraints or does it support you know, what, I, what I would call you know, institution building or autonomy that what indigenous people want? And in fact, what I argue is that it does not that it puts huge constraints on, indigenous, on the whole idea of indigeneity. And that the human rights, civil rights, and indigenous rights are very different things. And that, and that the, even the declaration itself does not really address indigenous rights. It addresses Indian people as if they were citizens of states. But that gives away the whole game. Yes? Um. I think that's a, a, a accurate point, meaning that you're reading the data correctly. I think that I'm, I'm thinking here of Anna Singh's work, which I hope my students in this room have read, where she argues that the only other option would be to be an ethnic minority on the international stage, which does not provide you a genre convention. You have no voice because there's no audience to hear you unless you sort of respond in a sort of Tolkien bill. You have to respond to the legal system that's able to make a space for you. So is there any other option besides going with the declaration? I mean, is there, do you even have a, is there a place to actually have a voice without speaking to the United Nations Forum? Um, well, um, actually I'm in favor of the declaration, despite the limitations. I mean, it does, I think, um, move in the right direction. And, and, and some things can be achieved within the framework of the existing declaration, some protections and some. And so, and so I'm not like, you know, against the implementation of the declaration. I think that the declaration simply does not go far enough and address the indigenous issues. And so that's what I think is the issue of the 21st century. I mean, the, uh, many of the, um, the um, um, diplomats at the UN see the 21st century as the century of um, increasing um, national pluralism, and, um, and so that nation. What, what, what's, what they argue is the problem in the past has been that the, the, the nation states have been trying to um, trying to create and assimilate one culture, uh, sort of, and, and, and not and not allowing other cultures to exist and express themselves. And so what they so they think that the 21st century is, you know, frankly, they, it's going to be you know not an easy trip. But I mean, but there'll be uh, increasing recognition of culture within the nation states and increasing appreciation and more separation, they hope, between culture and politics so that you can have a group of people who can agree to the, to the political uh, you know, infrastructure and then still have wide varieties of cultural diversity. Now, for, for I, that's, that, I think that's progress. I think it's a, good, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brilliant vision in some ways. It's going to be even hard to achieve that. But I would argue that the indigenous position will not work in the, under the pluralism. That indigenous, the indigenous people have different kinds of governments that if they're going to adhere to them, they in fact do not, do not have the same kinds of visions of, of culture, of, of social structure, of, of, of politics. In fact, like I said earlier, the nation states don't have the tools to conceptualize what indigenous people are and who they are. 
And so I think that beyond the pluralism, I think the real problem for the, for, for if you want to have real democracy rather than coercive relations toward indigenous peoples culturally and politically, you have to recognize indigenous people for who they are, who they want to be, and, but at the same time make friendly and democratic relationships between indigenous peoples and states. That's the problematic I see. And, and, and right now I don't see that there's any movement toward that or any, or any intellectual mechanisms by which the state can actually implement that. But it's, but it's, it's a process. And so I, what I would encourage people to continue talking about that. And in, 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 in the framework that I see is not so much a hostile framework or a framework of indigenous people, you know, walking out on nation states. Indigenous communities, frankly, are small, except for a few maybe around the world. But you cannot live by yourself. You cannot, you cannot operate independently. You need protection of a state. You have relationships with states. You just have to have much, much, much more democratic relationships. Uh, much more respectful relationships and mutually beneficial relationships would be the goal. I mean, trying to achieve that is, 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 is hard because nation states, even in the Declaration, do not want to recognize this political autonomy, the, the strong identity that indigenous people have, and so that will continue to be contended for the future. We have time for one more question, and then I would want to encourage people to get some food because otherwise it will be thrown away. So please make sure and you sign books. Um, and we also have this room till two o'clock, so there will be plenty of time to interact with our speakers. There are a few books left for purchase. And I want a second. I, I'd like to encourage you all to, to get a copy because you know it, it, the book deals with so many different aspects of um, contemporary Native life, you know, across the country, and answers so many or addresses some of these pesky questions about. Uh, sovereignty, um, identity, community, how these things are constructed, what they mean, and it gives some real meaning to concepts which are oftentimes, you know, um, unhinged from any kind of social reality and just used, um, I don't know, you know, rather more like fiction. Um, so I, I think it's a great resource, you know, and I, I really encourage you to get snap up those last copies. I mean, take just one, uh, you know, Dwayne's discussion of factionalism, which is this kind of, you know, tar target so often of, of outsiders' condemnations of native communities. Another word for factionalism is debate, eh? Hello? Uh, discussion? Uh, argument? Conversation? Or even caucus, which is an... Uh, caucus, right, right. And I, I love all of the, the 91 sort of terms and, 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 and themes that, uh, that you condense in these pages. Very helpful, very helpful. I think Cesar had a question of you. Yeah, I, so, but I, I'm, I'm not sure I know what I'm talking about, but uh, so I read, I read um, you know, about half of the essays in your book. Um, and um, so it, it seems to me that you, you're, you're, you know, when you talk about the Indian uh, way of being an Indian conception of life and so on, so you counterpose it to belonging to a national state, to modernity and so on. That, that you are, in fact, talking about something that's really definitional of what being an American is in, in a negative sense, meaning that like being an American is not being Indian, being an American is not being this, that in, that in fact, American Indian stories may be a good reflection on something m much larger than just American Indian communities, because it is ingrained in what this polity is. And, uh, and I want to say, not just this policy, but also the expansion of the Republic of abroad. I, I just concretely, yeah. I was thinking about this. I was thinking, you know, I was looking at a list of the colonial governors of the Philippines and Puerto Rico early in the 20th century. Almost to a man, they were all Indian fighters. You know, this is the personnel yeah. of, the, of the project of colonial expansion abroad. It formed what the colonial empire was. You know, it, it is <coughs> constitutive of what the United States is so like so i think your claim is like really narrow in the sense of um, um you're talking about just just native peoples but but you're not <laughs> uh, what the consequences of this discussion have have big fallout for for the entire you know big, big kind of uh, fallout is the word yeah or you know on on the entire political life of, of, of the nation state itself um, um that's actually a very insightful um yeah, I mean, what I'm. Um, so would you generalize it? You know, it's, 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 yes, yes. I, 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 I'm not sure if I'm answering your question directly, but um, uh, 
what I've been thinking about lately, partly based on some of the research we've been doing with actually one of the tribes here in the community, we, but which um, the uh, Tatavian is, um, is that we got 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 into talking, um, um, digging deeply into the transition between the. Um, the Spanish and the Mexican states and the United States and how different they were and how trust was the trust responsibility was was passed or not passed between those two different systems and um, and so I, I, in, in that in, in, in this parallel exactly what happened in Latin and South America and I'm not sure about Puerto Rico uh, but um, but 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 so the conception emerges that I've been sort of thinking about now is that the colonial system is in fact its own dynamic. And, and in the Western Hemisphere, it does have this, these papal bulls, and it has um, you know Indians defined as with souls, and so that subjects of the of the kings, and that the, so that there's a trust responsibility that they you know um, at least at least as a legal concept, but with really, how much they really cared about indigenous people. But the, but the king, the Spanish king, the English king, were supposed to be responsible for their subjects, involuntary subjects, um, and so and so 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 there all, is all of that. But when you start moving to na to nation states in the modern extent, and this starts frankly in the in the Napoleonic period. I mean, there is the French Revolution; it has all these ideals of freedom and equality and, and, and community and nationality. But 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 it's not Europe is where the, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the where the movement actually has any real effect, at least early. In fact, it's all through Latin and South America, where all those countries actually. Uh, um, 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 rebel against the Spanish and Portuguese empires, and 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 they um, and they set up nation states, what we would call now modernizing nation states, and it's all about equality, it's all about assimilation, it's all about nationality, in in places where that was ridiculous in some cases because places like Bolivia where you had 90 percent indigenous people who did not want to play, or even Mexico now that has whole groups of people who will not speak Spanish. That, that maintain indigenous identities all through Latin and South America. You still have these groups that are just not part of the system, and, they, and it's, a, it's a certain kind of um, passive resistance. But nation states ignored indigenous rights. It, it, it gave up on the whole business of of, um, of trust. You have U.S. and in, 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 um, and uh, Canada. It's embedded in the common law. There's, there's, there's the business about trust and land. But not very much about the responsibility, or not. And that is not clearly transferred. Is much transferred over. I mean, it, come, it becomes de facto now something to do with the welfare state of the United States, but nothing about promoting their economic well-being through the market and through, and through economic. You know, um, I mean, there's, there's probably it's probably um, one of the essays I write in the book is about um, the um, indigenous people being in the commerce clause of the Constitution. And um, and why and, and 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 why did the states become very prosperous and Indians became very poor? And so that and so that, well, they were in the same clause. But the um, um, but you're right. I, mean, I think that there's a that that, that the, the emergence of nation states in, during the Napoleonic period, especially in the, in, 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 in the North and South America, introduced a whole new social form that was very hostile toward certain other kinds of social forms, indigenous forms in particular, and it's very assimilative and, and it's very powerful. And, 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 and that's what indigenous people are fighting with. I mean, the kinds of relationships you have in colonial society are very different than the kinds of ones you have in nation state systems. So, and, and, and one of the other arguments I make is largely that, um, that you cannot have a full theory of social groups in, in a nation state without having a clear conception of how indigenous people work in that nation state. You can't just reduce nation state down into race and class and, and ethnicity. Um, you actually, you, you have to deal with the problem of indigenous people, and until you have that, you frankly have no real conception of the entire diversity of the people in the nation state. And I think it's really an avoided issue, actually. All right, let's. Well, can you please help me and thank our guests. Thank you.